right, welcome into Surviving Paradise, an ex-Jehovah's Witness podcast hosted by myself, Stacy Bauman. And what a crazy, crazy last few days it has been in the world of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was very tempted to do an entire episode just based on the insanity that we're starting to see at the district convention this week as Stephen Lett has unveiled the governing body's view of babies and children. But I'm going to hold off for now. I'm going to hold off for now. However, if you have not seen this and you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses who hasn't seen it or you're someone who's exploring the what, when, where, and hows, or you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness, go watch this insanity. I have vacillated between anger and tears the last couple days watching Stephen Lett. You might remember him. He's one of the eight guys in upstate New York that claims he has a direct relationship with Jehovah and his son, Jesus Christ. I watched him take to the microphone in front of millions of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide and tell us that babies are enemies of God. Babies. Little babies, you know, the one who fill their diapers, who just want a little love, who just want a little bit of food. They are born enemies of Jehovah God. And Stephen Lett went out of his way this week in his opening talk to tell us all about it. It just can't get more absurd. However, if you were ever in doubt as to whether Jehovah's Witness children are in danger in in any way, shape, or form, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. Imagine you're a child in the audience listening to governing body member Stephen Lett tell you that babies are enemies of God. Never mind that that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. Never mind that the Bible actually teaches something completely different, unless you're in the Old Testament where God is telling his righteous leaders to slaughter women, children, livestock. Of course, God drowned babies himself during the flood, subject for another time. Nowhere, nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus ever refer to children as enemies of him or his father, Jehovah God. Nonetheless, Stephen Lett, whether he considers this new light or just expounding on the idea that we're all born into sin, is now taking the time to make sure the world knows that babies, little tiny babies, are enemies of Jehovah God. If you haven't seen the clip, I highly recommend going to take a look at it. It it is just insane. And on this three-day weekend at the time of this recording, it is the 4th of July weekend in the United States. I'm on the West Coast. I thought I'd slip in a quick episode of Surviving Paradise, and I, I just had to comment on that. It has gone viral. I've seen several people talking about it on social media. It is just a level of stunningly stupid that defies any adult mind. And to think children are sitting in this audience. And listen, many of us grew up as Jehovah's Witnesses, and we have all kinds of mental and emotional issues from that. Don't fool yourself. I'm not being dramatic. I'm sure many people who listen can attest to this. I've certainly seen comments and DMs and, and YouTube comments from, from folks like myself that had, that can attest to this. But here we are in 2022. You know, just in 2018, Tony Morris is blowing out matches saying that God will extinguish his enemies and smirking and laughing on stage. Now we've got Stephen Lett telling us that babies, little brand new precious babies are enemies of God. It just, it, it just can't get any worse, and yet we know it will. So we'll comment on that on another day. This district, district convention is rolling out, and district conventions as a whole are something that we should talk about on this podcast. They've changed so dramatically. Now there's music videos, and you know we used to write talks. We don't anymore. They're manuscripts. They're videos. Everything's digital. They've got a TV studio. There's a drama that's just beyond hideous. I've seen clips of it. Uh, more damage to the teenagers of Jehovah's Witnesses. But man, if he doesn't start off the convention by ripping into babies, it just blows my mind. 
Thanks for hearing me out. I'm, I'm going to try to get in a quick episode of Surviving Paradise, some things that were on my mind this week that I thought I would share and get the opinions of those that are taking the time to listen or are exploring this world of Jehovah's Witnesses in 2022. And I wanted to talk about a subject that I was actually thinking about quite a bit over the last week. And I think it was basically because of our last episode here at Surviving Paradise. And if you're new to this, just know that that's pure sarcasm. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they're in a spiritual paradise in 2022, that everything is applicable via a spiritual paradise. Don't take anything literal. It's all spiritual. They're the happiest people on earth. But the subject I wanted to tackle, at least for a few minutes this week, was just that. And I may not do it justice in the short time I am going to talk this week. But that subject is paradise. And it's not a small subject. It's sarcasm in the title of this podcast. It is by far and away the key and centralized teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses today. They don't knock on doors to appeal to people to get into heaven. They're knocking on doors today and have been, as I will state, for many, many decades, encouraging people to embrace the hope of living forever on earth with animals and vegetables and fruit because there's not going to be any meat. Everybody's an herbivore. No, we're not going to go back to being naked. We're going to wear khakis and dresses, as you'll see in every illustration depicted in the Watchtower magazine and their publications. But this subject of paradise is a very, very, very important one. And I want to be sure that I get, give it some respect and gravity that is due in this episode. As many of those that are listening now, I, I would venture a guess that it's 98, 99% of those that may stumble upon this little podcast. You probably at one point, if you were a Jehovah's Witness, embraced the hope of living forever on earth. Perfect health perfect beauty, perfect house, perfect water, animals that love you, elephants, horses, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. All of these things were taught to us from the time we were absolutely young. If you were exposed to Jehovah's Witnesses as a kid, as I was, and I've stated before, born in the late sixties, really started to grow up in the early seventies when my mom was baptized in 1972. So we were part of that truth that leads to eternal life group that came in looking at 1975 as the end. And then I was getting my own panda bear. I was going to ride camels and run around paradise. Never happened. Never happened. Nonetheless, this doctrinal teaching, this, what they would call basic truth is at the center of everything Jehovah's Witnesses do today. It is by far and away their biggest message when they're out knocking on doors, that Jehovah and his son Jesus are going to destroy and wipe out billions of bad, nasty people, including babies, as we've seen, <laughs> that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses or refuse to not celebrate birthdays and become a Jehovah's Witness. They're all dead. And that's going to usher in after a great tribulation, won't go into that now, and then a paradise earth. And then another test, and then more paradise earth. On and on, this cycle goes. But nonetheless, when they come and they knock on your door, or they informally witness, as they call it, at a bus stop, or they stare you down with one of the book carts and hand you a book, what they want to tell you is that you can live forever on a paradise earth. There's one problem with this teaching. And let me tell you, I don't think there's anything that has more illustrations in their publications, is mentioned more often in the library. It's mentioned that that term paradise earth is mentioned thousands of times. It's the subject of millions and millions and millions of pages of the Watchtower, their covers, the illustrations, their books. But there's a fundamental problem with this entire thing. There's one big problem. It is not taught 
anywhere, at any time, in any verse in the Bible. <laughs> the very book that they claim guides their life and their every decision. The very book they try to encourage other people to read. The very book that contains the gospel accounts of their king that they claim took the throne in 1914. And then some decades later decided to begin teaching people about living forever on earth, despite the fact that he never taught it in the pages of the Bible. <laughs> so at the core, at the center of every Jehovah's Witness conversation is getting you to believe that you can live forever in a paradise earth, in perfection, in eternal beauty, with the eternally beautiful surroundings, animals, the perfect food, the very best of friends, perfect relationships. They spend millions of dollars to get you to believe this, that there is a paradise earth and that the Bible, in particular, Jesus Christ himself taught it. However, the term paradise earth never appears in the Bible. Neither does the belief that there will be a resurrection onto earth ever specifically discussed anywhere in the pages of the Bible. In fact, to take it a step further, the word paradise, just the word paradise is only used four times in the New World Translation of their doctored Bible the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. It's only seen four times. And in all four cases, the word paradise is referring to life in heaven. Never is it referring to anything on the earth. Jesus never taught it. The apostles never taught it. The men of old in the Old Testament that they like to revere, the, the major prophets, the minor prophets, the Abrahams, the Noahs, the Moses, none of them ever taught that mankind, if they were just obedient to a publishing company in upstate New York, would be living forever in a paradise earth. It isn't there. It isn't there. There is only one occurrence of the word paradise in the Bible that the watchtower or again, the eight guys in upstate New York claims is specific in reference to the earth. And it was Jesus in his closing moments when he turned to the thief next to him at Matthew 23, 42 through 43, where it says, quote, and he went on to say, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jehovah's Witnesses try to pass that off as Jesus himself talking about an earthly paradise. Folks, this isn't hard. The context is important. It's absurd to even claim that. Where is Jesus according to Jehovah's Witnesses? Oh, he's in paradise. In heaven. Not on a paradise earth. Nowhere in the gospel teachings will you see any mention whatsoever of Jesus talking about young children coming to him and that he was going to divide these groups up and the one would be a heavenly group of 144,000 in the heaven. Just a absolute spurious verse lifted from revelation among metaphor after analogy after metaphor after parable after metaphor. And then suddenly the 144,000 is literal. And then everybody else is going to live forever in a paradise earth. Only no one says that ever, anywhere. How long have they been teaching this? Well, it's interesting. The paradise earth teaching is another one of those things that if you look at it really closely, you get the quizzical question marks above your head that go, wait, what? Because that timeline with Jehovah's Witnesses is everything that they point to. Okay, and this paradise is critical. I'll get into that even in my own childhood. But remember, on the Jehovah's Witness timeline, they claim that they were chosen to be God's personal handpicked representatives in 1919. 
with Judge Joe. Now Stephen Lett, Tony Morris, Garrett Loesch, all those guys are just part of that group. They're part of that group that was chosen in 1919. The teaching that people would live forever in a paradise earth didn't come until almost two decades later. Up until that point, everyone who died before Jesus, including all the men of old in the Bible, the Moses, the Abrahams, the Isaac, the Jacobs, the Josephs, Rahab, Ruth, anybody who died before Jesus, they teach, is going to be resurrected to earth. Everybody that died after Jesus is going to be resurrected in heaven. Everybody, and here's the key date, after 1935, which is when they got quote-unquote new light about the great crowd mentioned in Revelation, two words, became an entire centralized doctrine, despite the fact that Revelation says they're all standing before the throne of, of the Son of Lamb in heaven. They lifted those term, that term, great crowd, and they said at a landmark convention in 1935 that everyone who died from that point forward or became a Jehovah's Witness from that point forward, the vast majority would once again be back to living on earth. So I think I confused that a bit. But in 1935, up until that point, Jehovah's Witnesses taught everybody was going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. In 1935, under Judge Joe, an interesting character in his own right, suddenly there's going to be a second group of people who live on earth. Huh? And then they reverted to everyone who died before Jesus, they're also going to join you on earth, which is why we get to meet Noah in paradise and we get to hang out with Moses. And I got a few questions for King David. You might too. Um, On and on this goes. But again, if you're just looking at the timeline, And I'm kind of bouncing all over the board here, but I think you get the point. Once again, in 1919, they were handpicked by Jesus. Jesus waited another 15, 16 years before he clued in the rest of the millions of people on the earth. Probably not, not probably not nearly as many people as there are today, but all those other people on earth, he kind of left them in the dark. They're all going to heaven. Whoops. No, now you're going to live on earth. Wait, what? Where did this come from? came from Judge Joe. It came from Judge Joe at what was at that time, for the most part, much like a district convention where he bounced off some new light that there was another group in 1935 that was going to suddenly live in a paradise earth. And from that point forward, they leveraged that entire belief, that doctrine into many that have gotten them in lots and lots of trouble with anybody whose brain synapses are firing including the last days, including generations, including overlapping generations. All of these things were based upon much of this core philosophy. Two groups, one in heaven, one on earth. After 1935, it's all earth. None of these people are going to die before the end comes. Oops, they're all dead. Now they overlap and on and on it goes. But the problem is this. It is not taught anywhere, anywhere in the Bible. And this is one of those examples for me that really highlighted the depth of cognitive dissonance. At the time, it wasn't even a phrase that I was all that aware of or that I really understood because I myself was drowning in the soup. I myself was a victim of this. I was bought in, as I've stated in past episodes. I became an elder. Nonetheless, There are those moments. Sometimes it's sitting in a kingdom hall. Sometimes it's taking a walk. Sometimes it's in bed where you go, well, wait a minute now. Where did Jesus ever talk about a paradise earth? Don't get a headache looking. It's not there. Paradise earth, the word paradise itself is mentioned four times. Four times. It is not something that you would think if it was affecting billions of people in the past and at this case in the future, you'd think it would be very clearly outlined by the king and especially through his eight guys in upstate New York. But the word paradise is only used four times in the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. 
And in that moment where Jesus turns to the thief and say, you'll be with me in paradise, it's very clear. You don't even have to be a scholar that Jesus is talking about heaven, which is all Christianity ever taught, which the vast majority of Christian religions teach today. Jehovah's Witnesses are extremely unique. They are a group of one that teaches everyone's going to live forever in a paradise earth that, you know, came along after 1935. Why 1935? Eh, pay no mind to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> the Bible talks about paradise. Only then you realize it really doesn't. It doesn't at all. And there are many ways to debunk this core doctrinal belief of Jehovah's Witnesses. And let me, let me just add right here that it's this, it's this piece, this teaching that could be devastating when you leave or when you come to the realization that you've been duped. For those of us that have been children raised in this thinking we're never going to grow old, we're never going to die in this system, and even if I do, I'm going to, in the blink of an eye, as we were told from the stage zillions of times, we're going to wake up in a paradise on earth with a lion licking my cheek and me eating a fresh apple, hanging out with Moses. When you realize that you've been duped by this nonsense, I don't even want to remotely minimize the emotional devastation that can take place. You'll go through a wide range of painful emotions. And if I'm being very honest, and I, I feel like I really try to bear my soul in this project, I still struggle emotionally some days. It can send some people into a dense depression. Tragically, it has caused some to take their lives. You grow up with your mind and your brain in its formative formative years between one and five years old being taught that you're never going to die. You're going to live in a paradise earth, no more sickness, no more racism, no more hate, no more violence. Everyone's doors are wide open. You get a big, beautiful mansion on a mountainside with a waterfall. You get your own elephant. When you're taught this stuff and you come to realize even as an adult that it was all fabricated, it's a lie. You deal with everything of the devastation that you're going to get old, that you're going to get sick, that you're going to die. You deal with the devastating blow to your self-esteem that you were duped and actually believe this. Especially so when you crack open the Bible and realize it's not taught anywhere. It's not taught anywhere in the scriptures. And I think it's really important for people to take that journey when they're looking at this and, and see that for themselves. Don't take a podcast word for it or another person or a talk, whatever the case may be. Don't do that. You owe it to yourself to see that this is complete nonsense. You can look at it from several different perspectives. One, the word paradise. There is no scripture anywhere in the, script, in the Bible that says mankind will be resurrected onto a paradise earth. You will not find it. It's not there. Paradise in the Bible, in the very few cases the word is used or translated, is speaking about heavenly life. Jesus spoke very openly about a second proof point that I invite you to dive into if you're doing research, and that's heavenly resurrection. If you're still a believer and you're a Christian and you believe in the Bible, the Bible very pointedly speaks of people being resurrected to heaven. It does not speak anywhere of people being resurrected to an earth. It's spiritual beings in the heavens, scripture after scripture in Romans, Corinthians, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them refer to heavenly life. A third way that you may look at this, if you're looking to prove this to yourself, good or bad, and I really do caution you to be ready for it, is to look at science. Science tells us that the planet Earth is not going to remain forever. Eventually, it will burn up and be destroyed by our sun exploding in this galaxy. And I won't go too deep into that because I respect everyone's different belief systems on that. But if you're looking strictly at science, you'll see that the Earth simply can't go on forever. It defies 
any kind of law of physics that we currently know. Now, you're going to get people and witnesses, well, everything is possible with God. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But science doesn't, doesn't support that. Not the science that we have now. Interestingly enough, the Bible itself, both the Old and the New Testament, both state that the earth will end. Not many people realize that. It actually says that in Scripture. It alludes to it. It's blatant. It also speaks about the earth living forever and we'll get into or being here forever and we'll get into that as well. But it's interesting that the Bible does speak about the earth disappearing, being gone, not lasting forever. Even God speaks about how he's going to replace this old earth that we're living on now with a new earth. Now, witnesses like everything. And if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, God, you remember these phrases, the anti-typical the spiritual application, or words like evidently, or similarly, where they just insert that into a comment from the Bible and say, that is the anti-typical situation that is marked by this so-and-so thing today. But the Bible does not teach that. It doesn't teach that anywhere. And so it's really something that even the Bible itself speaks about the earth being gone. Now, a fourth, or I've lost track, is it a fifth way that you can take a look at this? And one that is extremely popular with Jehovah's Witnesses, this matter of paradise. And, and it's no, no small coincidence, it's not a coincidence, that they tend to quote some of these very scriptures when they're looking to support their beliefs in living forever on a paradise earth. But... The Bible does speak and use the word forever, but, but I digress. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Everywhere that you find the Bible mentioning or speaking of the earth being around forever are all contained in basically two to three books of the Bible. Psalms. Ecclesiastes, and I believe there's some commentary on that in Proverbs as well. Psalms 37, 29 is the big one that Jehovah's Witnesses like to point to, ignoring everything else in the book of Psalms or Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, which are all made, Song of Solomon's another one, are made under poetic license. They're devoted to poetry. They were songs. we grown up, if you were a Jehovah's Witness, learning that David penned many of the songs when he was singing to Jehovah, looking out a window up at the stars. We've seen the illustrations. But Psalms 37, 29 is one they like to point to, where it reads, the righteous themselves will possess the earth and they will reside forever upon it. Psalms 104, 5, he has founded the earth upon its established places. It will not be made to totter to time indefinite or forever. On and on, Psalms 104, Psalm 78, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The problem is that if you understand poetic license, hyperbole, the emotional underpinnings of poetry, you realize that without any kind of additional support, these are emotional verses devoted to poetry. They're not prophetic. They're not even a parable. Much of what you see in Psalms and Ecclesiastes and some, especially those two books, which are really mostly poetry, really has to do with the Israelites, which is what the Old Testament was written for. Even the Watchtower recognizes this. Most of these passages refer to the Israelites and the promised land, the land that their God, Yahweh, had promised them that they were going to get to that he had established the earth. By the way, the earth in the time of, that these were written was how big? How much did they know? Was it round? How large was the planet? They didn't know any of this. None of it, like we do now. The whole terminology that people like to point to in the poetic books of the Bible is really 
really trying to put this thing together with duct tape. You have to go first to Jesus. He didn't teach it. He never taught it. And you'd think he would have. If there was only 144,000 people going to heaven, don't you think when he died for every man's sins, he might have want to kind of sort of mention for the rest of you billions of people that read this, you're going to live forever in a paradise earth ruled by me, eight guys in upstate New York, and you're going to have all kinds of good food. You're still going to have to shave, at least according to the illustrations I'm going to pump out through the eight guys in New York. But don't you think Jesus would have mentioned that? 144,000, and I'm not a math whiz, versus billions. But he didn't teach it. So to take these poetic verses out of Psalms and Ecclesiastes is, is just dishonest. It's just dishonest. The vast majority of anything that Jehovah's Witnesses use in the Bible, including the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, those are restoration prophecies. Ezekiel's another one. Restoration prophecies about the Jews getting back into the promised land, getting Jerusalem back, being freed from Babylon. It has nothing to do with a global paradise where people run around on the backs of elephants, living in mansions, drinking the cleanest water man has ever known. They have nothing to do with that. And at the risk of going too deep into examining Bible verse by Bible verse, which I'm simply not going to do, there are wonderful people who do that online. There are very scholarly people. However, if you just look at these verses with common sense, you will see that none of these things are remotely talking about a paradise earth. And again, why is this a big deal? Are we just harping on this? We're not. Because if a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door tomorrow, or you pick up a piece of their literature tomorrow, or you watch one of their videos tomorrow, the core teaching in this religion is that you and me have the hope of living forever in a paradise earth. And again, where do they get that from? Nobody knows because it is not taught in the Bible and never was. And as I started to and got off track, this issue of cognitive dissonance, to me, there are probably a dozen issues, most of which make up episodes on this podcast. But to me, this issue, this core teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses might be the brightest spotlight on the depth of cognitive dissonance that a common Jehovah's Witness lives in. They're drowning in it. You see it in many different teachings from the stage, but this one's a big one because they'll spew out Psalms 37, 29. They'll talk about a great crowd in Revelation. They'll say Jesus mentioned other sheep. Newsflash, they were Gentiles, if you read it. And they'll take all of these things out of context to prove that from 1935 on, Jehovah's Witnesses have had a a hope of living forever in a paradise earth. Never mind that Jesus didn't teach it. Never mind that even when he chose these guys in upstate New York, he didn't immediately right the wrong. How many people got this message between 1919 and 1935 and rejected the, the message because they didn't want to live in heaven? They wanted to live on earth. But Jehovah's Witnesses didn't teach that then, so they rejected them. Did they go back and find each person and correct that? Of course not. See our new light episode. <laughs> It's an incredibly important issue and really is just a dynamic and explosive example of how deluded, how misled Jehovah's Witnesses are. They will stand up, chest out, stay loyal, fight to the death, and claim that Christmas isn't mentioned in the Bible. They will fight to the death that many things aren't mentioned in the Bible. College, sports, school. And they'll tell you it's not mentioned in the Bible, therefore we don't do it. We don't do it. And yet 
paradise earth and human beings living forever upon it, billions, see our resurrection episode, billions in the past, millions or billions in the future are going to live on it, isn't taught anywhere, nowhere, and most especially not by Jesus himself. Now, if you wanted to take it a step further, and sometimes for those who may still be believers and are believing in a, a heavenly resurrection, we respect that. But if you're not one of those people and you want to look just at mere logistics, mere science, mere probability, take a look at what it would mean for billions and billions of people to live on this planet. And I want to point out right now that the earth is taxed. Environmentally, it is stressed. We're seeing things in weather. We're seeing things in natural disasters. We're seeing things in the food supply and resources that, that are being exhausted. And yet we are to believe that instantaneously man is going to live in a paradise earth. And not just man today, but billions who've lived prior to this. So this is where the questions come as you're a kid. And I, I actually had a book study connector in the early 19, ah, mid-1970s when I was a kid. And I, and I stole it and used it later when I was a book study connector. I actually thought it was genius at the time. That he had us kids do a homework assignment each week at the end of the book study. It was done in homes. For those that are newer, didn't realize the book study actually was my favorite meeting because it was only like 25, 30 people. You got to be friends with people. It was a little more intimate. But he had the kids draw a picture of paradise. Uh, at least that's the one I remember. That was one of our homework assignments. Put the animals you want to have. Put the house you want to have. Show us what it'll look like in your mind's eye. And we went away that at, at the time, Tuesday night, and we went and drew our pictures. And then the following Tuesday night, at the end of book study for 10 minutes or so, he'd have all the kids show their paradise picture and what it meant to them. And I'll tell you, it was genius. It was genius. I stole it as a book study conductor when I was a grown man myself. And I'll, I'll be really honest with you. Seeing the joy on children's faces, the little guys, the little girls, that just just watching them talk about it. And they were so excited about the, the tiger they drew and, and, and all of this. But they start planting that in the minds at a very, very, very young age, even if it's well-meaning, even if it's well-meaning. But consider this, because it's not you're not far from drawing your favorite tiger, house, and waterfall to being a few years older going, well, uh, wait a minute. You're a teenager considering baptism, and it suddenly hits you. If billions of people before are going to live, and and maybe billions come out of Armageddon or or millions, whatever the case may be, the, the earth's going to be at capacity. So will I be able to have babies? Will, will there ever be uh, a time where people can continue to procreate and have families, have people? It's a very interesting question. It's a very interesting question. In 1988, the Insight book, those were two green volumes of Jehovah's Witnesses, made the comment, is still using the estimate that only 20 billion people had ever lived, despite the fact that just since 1900, 9 billion people have lived. So in all of human history before that, only 11 billion, they're still using this erroneous number, which by the way, the insight books are now mothballed. If you've got one, hold on to it. But it doesn't remotely speak to what science and secular authorities think in terms of world population. Population Reference Bureau estimates that 105 billion people have been born just in the last 2000 years. The earth itself has a 148 million kilometers of land. With 6 billion people, the average amount of land per person is 5 acres. With 100 billion people, that would be reduced to less than one-third of an acre each. It's not even sustainable. 
to understand the magnitude of that figure, in 2000, China had 135 people per square kilometer. With 100 billion people resurrected, there would be over 715 people per square kilometer. Excellent math work by Paul Grundy on JW Facts, I might add. Unbelievable. From a strictly logistical standpoint, this fantasy that Jehovah's Witnesses have pushed down people's throats for the better part of a century, going on a century, isn't even logistically possible. Somebody is going to get sifted out as not worthy, or maybe we just have too many people. But certainly these people that have been encouraged by Jehovah's Witnesses to hold out having a family, hold out doing all these things, as we covered in another episode, that bring you such great joy, they, they may patiently hold out and then still not be able to enjoy those things. If God just decides we're all neutered, uh, or, or God, uh, the eight guys in upstate New York, when they get to heaven, you know, Stephen Lett, the guy who says babies are God's enemy, gets to heaven and decides, ah, let's neuter them. We're getting a little crowded down there on earth. Now, it's very interesting. And forgive me, I haven't had time prior to this, but someone bring it up. I'll bring it up on a future podcast. I believe it was Worldwide Prince of Peace book in the late 80s, kind of a mauve grayish colored, one of the smaller books, insinuated and boy, was this a Kingdom Hall convo. If anybody remembers this, I'd love to hear about it. But insinuated that the earth may become too crowded. So hmm, maybe Jesus and his king priest brothers will let us inhabit other planets. <laughs> Not kidding. I will find the quote. I will never forget it. But they drop it into a paragraph towards the end of the book that, eh, Who's to say we won't make rocket ships and fly around and inhabit other planets? One thing's for certain, you're not going to heaven, despite all the teachings in the Bible to that effect. You're going to live on Earth in a paradise Earth. Then they started hitting, maybe you'll live on Mars in a paradise Mars. Or maybe you'll live in a paradise Jupiter in a paradise Jupiter. They, they literally reached and alluded to this in that book. I will never forget it. And forgive me for not coming prepared on this podcast to share that quote with you. It's unbelievable. I'll find it. That book, I'm sure, has been mothballed. I'm almost positive. We studied it in the book study, and boy, was that a one-hour discussion, that paragraph. So just logistically, this teaching of a paradise earth, it isn't something that could possibly happen on this planet. And I won't even go into the environmental statistics and scientific statistics that would prove how much this would tax the planet Earth. And I know, I know, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, your, your knee-jerk reaction is, well, all things are possible with Jehovah. Okay. Okay. But he didn't teach this. It's not taught in the Bible. It wasn't taught in the Gospels by the King himself, Jesus. The only people who've ever come up with this, and isn't this interesting, are guys past and present in upstate New York in Brooklyn Bethel in the past. Men. Men who realize that 144,000 people in heaven, you know, that's not much. That's not much when you consider how many people have lived throughout eons of time. So there must be, there must be another hope. And it, the convention escapes me at this moment too. Forgive me, 4th of July weekend, I'm a little foggy, but this was a convention where I, I believe it was Rutherford stood up and said, and he made people stand who suddenly believed that they were no longer going to heaven. They were now going to live on earth in 1932, I believe. Then in 1935, it became solid. Someone correct me if, if I'm off there by a year or two. And people stood in the audience and the, cla the clapping and the emotion was outrageous. And oh my God, look at that. In the 30s, suddenly God is opening up the planet Earth to a paradise Earth where I'll get my own elephant, a nice pair of slacks. My wife still gets to wear a dress. I still can't shave. I'm going to still live in paradise forever. Am I going to have babies? Well, that's not important. 
can I remarry a mate that passed away before Armageddon? Nah, that's not important. Don't ask those questions. They did almost everything at an early stage in this organization's history to keep people drowning in this. And nowhere was this more pushed and really like a fire hose than in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, the books, all the books, all designed not for people who are going to heaven, but people who are going to live in a paradise earth. The problem being, it's the same two or three scriptures they use. When read in context, you can see they have absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing to do with a paradise earth. And so you have millions of people drowning in a fantasy in something not taught by any other religion, something that scholars realize is absurd. It could be a ride at Disneyland. It's that ridiculous. Maybe they could play a small world. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know. But the level of absurdity is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. So I encourage everyone, and, and I'd love to hear from other people as to everything they dealt with this. I, I think I've gone in the past into some of the questions I had as a young man, as I grew older and my mind developed and I matured and I studied, you know, my, granted at that time period, it was all watched our Bible and track society literature for the most part. But even then the logical mind has questions, good questions, valid questions, questions that as a young person, you're taught, just wait on Jehovah, just wait on Jehovah. You don't need to know that. You don't need to, will, will that matter in paradise? Is that going to matter when you're eating the world's best banana? That's how a young person gets answered. And so much like last week's episode, we're taught to delay our happiness with the realization being that we will soon live in a paradise earth where everything will be perfect. But I say again in closing, people, that is not taught anywhere in the Bible or by Jesus himself. So what kind of questions did you have? If you were someone around my age group, grew up in the 70s, 80s, you too can live forever in a paradise earth, the red book, the blood red book. God, that book was awful looking back. But what kind of questions did you have? How did you reason on this? And on a really serious note, on a serious note, if you're a witness listening or someone who struggled with it, Please don't minimize your emotions when you realize painfully that this was never true. I, I think that there needs to be an entire conversation around the devastating emotions that come from that. What that feels like, how we deal with it, how we deal with it moving forward. Even when you've come to accept it, the pain, watching yourself get older, knowing you're not going to live in a paradise earth knowing that you need to act now to try to help people around you to make the world a better place. How did you deal with that? I'm curious. Well, that's it this week from Surviving Paradise. I am eternally grateful for you tuning in, listening to these episodes, as I always do. I just want to say a big thank you to those folks that are commenting, reaching out privately, DMs, YouTube, Twitter. Really, really appreciate it. I am really trying to shape this thing more towards my personality. So I appreciate your patience as I want to talk a lot more about the human side of this thing and a lot less about the doctrine, but you just can't seem to get away from the doctrine. We just try to explore why it is we feel and how we deal with our experience as a Jehovah's witness or as someone that may be considering leaving. So please, as we close out, thanks again. Look forward to your comments like, subscribe on YouTube. We appreciate all the time you take to listen to this, but I'd really, really like to hear other people's experiences in the short, small way we can communicate online. And I want to thank you again. Thanks for walking through me this week. Oh, God, the sarcasm. As we contemplate surviving the spiritual paradise of Jehovah's Witnesses, I will see you next week. <laughs>